Good morning. Say, how's your day doing? I say, every day without snow is a good day, amen? <laughs> so I think I know everybody here, but if you don't know me, my name is Mike. i uh, been here for about a year now, a little over a year and a half, and I preached last week, if you were able to watch it online, and uh, it's always an honor to be able to speak here at Hopewell. I say it every time because I mean it every time. Uh, Pastor Bud and Miss Jen, it's glad to have you back. I hope you enjoyed your week. Uh, if you didn't know... They took a week to refresh, to spend to, some time together in God's Word, spend time together just with each other, and, uh, and it was actually out of cell phone range where they went. And I don't know about anybody here in this church, but I had a little bit of anxiety because I couldn't reach the pastor. I found myself texting him Monday, and I said, but I got this problem. And then after I'd sent the text, I went, oh, he didn't get that. So I was left to face it on my own, and Man, to my own anxiety and my own, I got thinking, I'm like, who do I got to talk to? Well, that's the importance of life groups here. If you're not a member or you're not joining one of the life groups at Hopewell, let me encourage you to join one. And here's the reason why. A life group is more than just a Bible study. Hopefully, over the next seven, eight weeks, if you've never been one and you're learning about these life groups for the very first time, you're going to make friends. You're going to meet a group of like-minded believers who are struggling through life the way that you are struggling through. And when Pastor Bud's not available, and let's be, let's be honest, Pastor Bud can't be there for everybody all the time, even though we wish he could. We will have people that we can reach out to and share our problems with. I am actually hosting a, a men's life group on Friday nights because let's face it, if you're a guy, you probably hate sharing your feelings anyways. I could make the shameless joke, your wife tells you how to feel, but we won't go there. But nonetheless, the men's group, uh, I want us to be able to make some friends. I want us to be able to have some good food. They're going to have fish fries on Friday nights. So I encourage you, yeah, men, we eat well at our groups. So I encourage you to come be a part of our group on Friday nights, uh, 7 to 8 p.m. We would love to have you there. Uh, it's a good group of guys. I invited some of my friends outside of the church because they recognize we've did men's group in the past, how important it is to have somebody that you can speed dial when you need help. I made the joke on Friday night, uh, my buddy Bruce, he's there, and I said, you know why Bruce is here? And the other people in the group said, why is Bruce? I, I said, because every time I need something heavy lifted, I call him. I said, so I got to stay friends with him because I can't lift this stuff by myself. So nonetheless, the life group is very very important. And we have sign-up sheets out in the hallway. I encourage you to join one. And maybe you don't like those life groups. Maybe you don't like those people. Maybe you want to do something online. Hey, we'll help you set something up online. But we encourage you to be a part of something because we are a community. We are a group of people and life is done better together. So last week, if you were able to watch online, I, I spoke about the parables. We are talking about Jesus' parables and it was the Good Samaritan. This week is kind of a continuation of that. It's actually the story of the woman at the well. Now, it's not a parable, but as Bud wanted me to say this morning, it's an extension. It's Jesus living out what he had just got done teaching and the parable of the Good Samaritan. So to recap for you, I just wanted to read here in Matthew 22, verse 37. It says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. As Christians, that's probably the easy one, right? We love God, we try to give Him everything that we have, and we know that He forgives us when we mess up. That's probably the easiest one. And in verse 38 says, this is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And as I mentioned last week, that's a heck of a lot harder when we try to love people outside of our area of influence. When we see those people who are struggling, who are oppressed, who are on the outside feeling less than, it's hard to love somebody when we may not agree with them. Let's be honest. Amen. <laughs> it's hard to love somebody when their ideals maybe don't line up to you. But Jesus says, love them as much as you love yourself. 
Now, we clothe ourselves, we feed ourselves, we provide for ourselves. We sometimes buy ourselves nice big TVs or nice cars or nice makeup. Whatever it is, we generally show ourselves a lot of love. Well, we're supposed to show that same love to those who are outside of us. Jesus used someone at the time that the religious leaders would have looked down on, a Samaritan, someone who was considered less than, to show love. That would have been a stinging moment for them. Could you let someone you don't like love you? Be kind to you? Show you compassion? So this week, as I mentioned, it's not necessarily a parable, it's a story, it's Jesus uh, living this out and showing is the the woman at the well, and we're going to be in John chapter 4 here in a moment. And if you have any Christian background, you've heard the story told a million times. Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at this well. He has a conversation with her. And eventually her whole town is saved because of this. But the story is so much deeper than that, if we're honest, and we try to look a little bit underneath the surface. So again, if we go to John chapter 4, Starting in verse 1, it says, The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although the fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Funny how people always want to keep a tally of everything that we're doing, the good and the bad. People want to look out at us and they say, but you're not doing that. Or they want to compare themselves to you and they actually they feel bad because they're not even living up to what you're doing. But the Pharisees were keeping tally because they were trying to compare Jesus and John at this point. But it was never about that. It was building souls for the kingdom of God. Now in verse 4, here's a key verse. It says, Now he had to go through Samaria. If I had a, a map up here, you have to understand, yes, going through Samaria would have been the most direct route. But I told you, the Jewish people at that time did not like the Samaritans. So, in fact, they actually went around the town of Samaria. They would follow the river down. They would go the long way to get where they had to go. That's how much they hated these people. So, for a, a Jewish leader, someone like Jesus, it would have been not normal to go through Samaria. Yet, in verse 4, it says, he had to go through so when he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of the ground Jacob, it given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. It was about noon, middle of the day. And again, we go back to the geographical where this is located at. It would have been hot. It would have been dusty. You wouldn't have wanted to be at the well at noon. Oftentimes, uh, the women would come down to the well and draw the water for the day, and they would come down in the morning when it was cooler. It would be uh, the meeting post for a lot of people. That's where the gossip would take place. That's where friends would meet, they would talk, they would get together, maybe they would have laughs, they would make plans for dinner later, I don't know. But nonetheless, everybody went in the morning. So Jesus comes and he sits down by this well, He's tired, and he's thirsty, but he had a purpose to his travels. And in verse 7 it says, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Now again, in this story, it would have been very bizarre for a Jewish man to ask a woman, let alone a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water. I know that we live in the land of equality today and women are treated equal to men, but understand back then this woman would have been considered less than a donkey. This woman would have had no value to any Jewish leaders at the time. And yet he asked her for a drink. And in verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew 
and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. See, she was used to the past. She was used to how she was treated. So why should it be any different that this person treated her the same? But he didn't. So it confused her. So she asked the question, why are you asking me for a drink? I think we've all in those moments would ask the same question after someone has ignored us for so long and they come up and they said, will you help me? We'd been confused. We wouldn't have understood. And as we read along in verse 10, it says, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In verse 11, Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it as himself, as did his sons and his flocks and his herds? In verse 13, Jesus says, Everyone who drinks the water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. There's a lot in that verse, so let's unpack that for a moment. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. They say that if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, that's the definition of crazy. So many times I see, is, I, I am a social media junkie, and I always tell my wife, I said, it saddens me, but I can tell who's going through marital problems at that time. We tend to air our dirty laundry on social media because we're looking for that connection. We're looking for someone to feel sorry for us. But ultimately, what that leads is to people giving bad advice, if we're honest. And if you keep going to that well of bad advice, you're never going to be able to make a change. I have a friend, and I won't say his name, but he's struggled with a lot of jobs over the last few years, always making an excuse why he can't hold down a job. And I finally looked at him and said, you realize you're the only common denominator in all of this? I said, maybe it's time to try something new. I know a young lady who was seeking marriage, counseling marriage advice and was going to all of her friends at the office. Every woman at that office was cheating on their, on their spouse at the time. Not very good advice if you want marriage advice if someone's cheating on their spouse, are they? This woman was continually coming to the well at noon to avoid the gossip. She was hiding something. Or maybe she was trying to hide something, as we'll read, that Jesus knew all about it. She was looking for more. She was thirsty. As we continue to read along, when I find out where I was at, <laughs> In verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and I have to keep coming here to the well. Keep coming here to draw water. See, she still thought he was talking about the well in front of her, the literal well, that Jesus was talking figuratively about himself. In verse 16, he says, Go and call your husband and come back. And in verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. See, this woman was hiding the shame and the guilt of having multiple husbands and now living with somebody in sin. In this day and age, it would have been looked down upon. It would have been shunned. She would have been outcast. And that's why she was at that well at that moment. And Jesus met her at that moment. If you remember a while back when I did a, a sermon, I had the God can sermon. And we all brought up notes and we all prayed for stuff. And as I was preparing this message, my daughter looks at me and she says, are you bringing out the God can again? 
And I said, I am, but a little differently this time. See, this woman was looking for love in all the wrong places. Have you ever looked for love in the wrong place? Have you ever looked for satisfaction? Satisfica- yeah, I can't say the word. Have you ever looked to be satisfied through means that are not appropriate? Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's pills. Maybe it's drugs. Sorry that there's young ones in this room, but maybe it's pornography. When you have a troubled marriage, you tend to look for other things that will satisfy you or that you believe that will satisfy you. Jesus kept saying it's not about the bucket, it's about the well. But if we're honest, these buckets really have no meaning. But some of us, we hide behind food. I know I do. When we're hurt, when we're troubled, we go and we, we get that food, we get that comfort because it makes us feel good. And then we get mad at ourselves because then we don't feel so good. We get mad at ourselves because we went off on a bender and we gained back that 10 pounds we just lost. We let this fill us up. Then we say, maybe I got to work harder. I got to get another job. I got to get a better bucket. This bucket is too dirty. I need a new bucket. I need a clean bucket. And then that doesn't work. Then we say, maybe I need a smaller bucket. I'm doing too much. I know when people are struggling, because I see it on social media, probably more than anybody, I'm going to focus on me now. My bucket's too big. This is my bucket. You can't have anything in it. This is only about me. I'm not going to pray for you. I'm not going to visit you. I am only going to worry about myself. And then some of us, this was a clean bucket. They go out and they get a new, they get a shiny bucket. They believe a new car, a new TV, a new something is going to make them happy. But as we continue to go back to these buckets, it's not about the bucket, it's about the well. It is where we are drawing our life from. Back a while ago, there was a young man who was in his youth group, and he said, most of us are either bucket dippers or bucket fillers. A bucket filler is someone when people are who are struggling, you build them up. You are there for them. You are praying for them. You're helping them. You're trying to fill them bucket up so that they feel whole. And if we're honest, if we look deep in our core, some of us are bucket dippers. We always want. We're always needing a shoulder to cry on. We're always hurting. We're always trying to take from somebody else. We're tearing them down. We're not there to support them in the way that they need. I actually added a third bucket to this because this is where I tend to fall in, I think. I tend to be a bucket checker. I've lost a few friends from this, and I will tell you from this stage, I'm sorry. If you're watching online, I'm sorry. I have a tendency to look in someone else's bucket and go, that ain't the right stuff. I have a tendency to look over here and go, you're doing it wrong. I know the best way. Kind of a pride thing, if I'm honest. If I admit that openly here today, I need to be worried about my own bucket, not at other people's. I think you can be truthful with people, but also have grace. And that's what Jesus gives us. But if we continue on in the story... In this event, something that actually happened. It says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers have worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And I used to get hung up on this verse. Because I'm like, why is it in the middle of this story? But what she's doing here is deflecting. Anyone here deflect the problem when you're confronted with it face to face? I know I have. I don't have that problem. I've never done that before. No, no, no. That ain't me. You're wrong. She was trying to deflect it because Jesus put her sin up front. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. 
You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of wor worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus was revealing himself to this woman. Letting him know that it wasn't just the Jews, but it's the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews and everybody will worship God together. And in verse 25, the woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus says this, I who speak to you am he. He revealed himself in the moment of her hurt and in the moment of her pain. And he will meet you there when you are struggling and he will strengthen you and he will fill you with that living water if you will just start drawing from that well. And as mentioned earlier, the disciples, a bunch of Jewish boys, they would have been young Jewish men, they returned. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? They were probably uh, awestruck, amazed. Because understand that these young men, they were not religious scholars by any means. They were fishermen, they were workers. But they knew you didn't talk to the Samaritans. They knew those were outsiders. We don't have any part with outsiders. But here's Jesus having a conversation with someone unexpectedly. And it surprised him. And as the story goes, and some people like to say the woman was surprised or taken back that all of these Jewish men showed up. So she runs off, leaves her bucket of water, and she runs off and tells the town that she had just met Jesus. Now this is the same People she was avoiding, she just ran to tell them about Jesus. When is the last time you went and told someone you've been avoiding for the last year about Jesus? When is the last time you went and told someone that you've been avoiding for your life about Jesus? This woman was avoiding these people because of the life she was living and the first people she wanted to tell about when she met Jesus. How amazing is that? The woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Christ? See, we hide nothing from Christ. We might be able to shut the door, turn the lights off, delete what's on our phone, delete what's on our computers. We might be able to hide stuff from our family, our friends, our kids, our spouses, but you cannot hide from Christ. He sees through it all. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. This kind of proves their thought process here. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? They went in to get food and they're so confused that Jesus didn't eat that they missed what he was doing. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say for months more and then the harvest? Or four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages, even now the harvest crops for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows, another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Christ has already died on the cross. He has already died, excuse me, for our sins. It's our job just to share the good news with everybody. And that's what he's pointing out to them here. And in verse 39 it says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. I always tell you to practice your testimony. Practice your come to Jesus moment. 
I almost say this every sermon because I try to practice mine. I know when my moment went from belief to faith. 2010, shortly after my divorce. That's when I knew that a relationship with Christ, you could draw living, active water and he would be active in your life. Now it took me being at the lowest of my lows to realize that. And sometimes that's where it happens. But when we practice our testimony, it is important because it allows us to share it with those who need it the most. We don't just broadcast online so that our faithful church followers can see it when they're not here. We want you to know those who are watching online, this message is for you because you too can know Christ today. The internet has made sharing Christ more possible than ever. The Bible app that many of us have on our phones has been able to share Christ more than we ever could. Ironically, I picked up my phone today and I opened it up. If anyone has an iPhone, it tells you your statistics for the week, what you've been doing. Tells you what bucket you've been drawing from. So I said, let's look at mine today. I picked up my phone 588 times in seven days. The highest day was on a Monday. 97 times I picked up my phone and opened it up. In 24 hours, that's quite a bit. If I sleep for eight, that's in 16 hours. Minus four for kids and driving. It tells you that's a lot of times to pick up your phone. What's my number one? Now you would think as a preacher it would be something else, I know. But what was my number one thing? What was the number one bucket that I was dipping from this past week? And I am not proud of this, but I'm sharing it, being open with you, my friends and my church family. It was Facebook. And if I'm honest, it wasn't to share messages about Christ. It was probably to check other people's buckets. Next was text messaging, then emails, and then internet. I was happy though. The Bible app made it in my top eight. So I am reading the Bible a little bit. But ironically, as I tell you today, it's not about the bucket, it's about the well. I realize that I too, even as a pastor, get caught up in the moments of drawing from the wrong well. I put in here, in Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 through 20, and this was in our men's group. It says, But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? And he's talking to his brothers here as they've come here during the famine. And they're worried that he's going to take retribution. He's going to take revenge against them. He says, don't be afraid. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God can use the evil in this world. He can use the poor decisions for good. Albeit this woman at the well had been struggling, who knows how long, had been in inappropriate relationships, seeking love and fulfillment from all the wrong people. Jesus met her in that moment and a whole town was saved because of her testimony. The woman had been scorned and judged by society, cast out. Society treated her very poorly, and I'm sure many people in this room or watching online, you can say, I feel treated poorly. I feel treated unjustly. Maybe you've treated people unjustly or poorly. But God, but God used it for good. He can turn anything into good if we allow it. In John chapter 4, 13 and 14, I wanted to read it again. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Give you an example of this. Young friend of mine, he's entering into the LAMP program and he's leading his teen ministry at his church right now. And he says, Mike, 
I can come up with all these messages. I'm, I'm preparing weeks out. I can't get enough. I can't wait to share these messages. W- what's going on? I said this because you're spending time in the Bible. You're spending time with God in prayer. And you're drawing from the well of living water. I can tell you there's times when I have been asked to preach that I have been dry because I haven't been focused on the right, right things. And I was just proud of this young man because I know it becomes easier and easier and easier and easier to do the will of God if you're drawing from Him. It's easier to be more generous. It's easier to be a little more loving and understanding. It's easier to be a bucket filler instead of a bucket dipper or a bucket checker. It's never about the bucket. It's not about how big it is, how small it is, how nice it is. It's about the well. So this morning, I ask you one simple question. What are you drawing from daily? And what do you need to change? Would you mind praying with me this morning? Would you please bow your heads? Close your eyes. And as we sit here for a moment and we reflect, I want to read one more verse. And it's Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 30. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Dear Heavenly Father, these people who are here this morning and who are watching online, I lift up to you. I pray that they receive the living water that you are offering daily. You are offering hourly. You are offering minute by minute. Father, I pray you help them turn away from what they've been drawing their, their life from and turn to your living water. Father, this morning there are people who are hurting. There are people who are struggling. There are people who didn't want to be here today because they just said, I can't do it today. Father, I pray that you give them your rest. I pray that you lighten their burden and they're willing to receive it. Father, we thank you for everything that you've done, the grace that you have provided, and the life that you have given us. In your name we pray. Amen.